If you follow the political change, the former U.S. President Donald Trump is making the final plea not only to the general voters, and particularly he's focusing on evangelical voters. Now, at this moment, if you pay attention to the poll numbers, among the key battlegrounds that Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are actually locked in a very tight race, now, at this moment, it's not just about this political battle, it's more about the word called political ideology. If you pay attention to the political rhetoric from the conservatives, then we understand it's one thing that protects a nation's interest, but it's also something else that Donald Trump is trying to do. So in other words, trying to make better friends with the allies and also trying to make friends across the nations. How much do we actually understand this political rhetoric when it comes to far right? And also, what about the actors outside the U.S.? Are they actually genuinely making interest to building a better relationship with the U.S.? Or are those just political sound bites? And in this episode, and we're going to address those critical issues. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is Matt Henson. And Matt Henson just completed a one-year research and teaching fellowship in Budapest, Hungary, where she was a senior fellow in the Budapest Fellowship Program and the visiting fellow at the Donald Bay Institute. And previously, he served as a president of a think tank in Vermont, which was affiliate of the State Policy Network. Well, Matt, and welcome to The Missing Piece. Thank you, Will. Thank you for inviting me to the show. I'm really excited about our conversation. Me too. I'm very, very honored to uh, connect with you. Now, Meg, again, as we mentioned before, initially when I discovered you, because this critical and amazing article that you wrote, which is entitled, America's Right Got Hungary's Victor Orban's Wrong. Now, before we talk about Victor Orban, let's talk about this whole far right or this political rhetoric from the right perspective. I mean, again, as I mentioned in the intro, Donald Trump is making the final plea to the evangelical voters. But I have to say, and again, you're the expert, that since Donald Trump appeared in this political arena, it's not just about his opinions or his policies. It's really this brand new far right ideology. So from your perspective, let's start from the basic how should we evaluate political uh, performance and especially this right or uh, conservatism under Donald Trump? Is he actually interrupting this traditional value and also he's creating something brand new in order to secure his political base? Your thoughts? Wow, that's a lot. But just to start off, let me uh, say that the article that you're referring to that was published in the Wall Street Journal talks about a certain faction of the American right and their views on Hungary. And uh, my argument is that it's not exactly the whole picture. Mm. Um, however, this article actually really fits in. If you think about um, the story that your podcast is saying on the whole, um, which is China's involvement in South America, China's involvement in Africa, the mm. Middle East, the Muslim world, world, and even Western Europe with Macron, etc. Um, the research that I've done on which this article um, is, is founded introduces a new element to the picture, which is Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Mm. And what is China's role in these particular uh, parts, which you can say sort of the the periphery of Europe, mm. the forgotten part. It used to be called the second world um, when this, when it was under the Soviet bloc. Um, so wh why does that affect the American right? How does that have anything to do with the American right? Well, so the China is really, really interested in the Balkans, like Serbia, but it's also interested in Hungary. Mm. And Serbia and Hungary are two countries that um, represent the maximum amount of foreign direct investment by mm. China. And China has really been focusing not only on uh, sorry, investment, but also infrastructure uh, with uh, Huawei broadband technology and including logistics and sort of transportation, all of that. Now, uh, the difference between Serbia and Hungary is that Hungary is a part of the European Union mm. and it is a part of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And so mm. therefore it is an ally of the West. And this has been institutionalized. However, if you've seen the, the news recently, uh, Viktor Orban, who's the prime minister of Hungary and who has been in power since 2010, mm. 
and we can talk about it later, but he will be in power for as long as he's around. He's really consolidated um, his power structures there. He has been trying to seduce or, let's say, court um, a certain faction of the American right. Why mm -hmm. is that? Because he sort of created this um, narrative about what Hungary is. Um, and this ties in with a lot of factors, the most recent being the 2015 Syrian refugee crisis when a whole bunch of um, Syrian refugees and other refugees from the, from the Middle East and the Muslim world flooded into Europe and all of that. And he stood up and said, we don't want any refugees. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of moving parts there. But basically what he did is he, um, he and his party presented an image of Hungary being the sole brave defender of Christianity, mm. of the national sovereignty. And whether that's true or not, we can, we can talk about that. But this image is what was very deliberately um, presented to American conservatives, the American right. And um, it was sort of like a David and Goliath, like, look, look at the, look at the EU. They're in, they're based in Brussels. They're a bunch of, uh, unelected, faceless, nameless bureaucrats, and they just do as they wish. They don't care about us. Um, and now we can tie in the whole part about wokeism or that ideology, which is uh, gender, sexual I mm. you know, ideology that looks at superficial diversity, like our skin color, mm. over merit, over character, all those factors. They basically, this narrative about good versus bad, and here's big bad Goliath, which is secular and full of woke ideology that has lost its way. And Little Hungry here is David, which is fighting uh, for the true legacy of Christian Europe. And so this narrative, like I said, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong right now. It's sort of a complicated issue that we can discuss. But this narrative is what was sold. or mm. They're trying to deliberately sell it mm. to American conservatives, a certain faction of it. So the American right is not a monolith, as no faction is. There are many aspects of it. There's a part that's very much in bed with the deep state. People mm. call that the uni party because they just um, do exactly what, by deep state I mean permanent Washington DC. So all the bureaucracies, the agencies, the intelligence agencies, the national security state, the military industrial complex, all these massive institutions, there are definitely a part of um, the Republican Party, the national level, the state level that are very much in sync with that. Mm. Then there are other people who People call them rhinos, which means Republicans in name only. They don't stand for anything. They're opportunistic. But then there are others who are actually conservatives. They actually believe in free market economics. They believe in the family. They believe in the nation. They're patriotic. Um, and they do not like um, what's happening with American society, the uh, devaluation of merit, the the um, elevation of racial division of, you know, gender ideology for children, all of that. It's, it's, it's sort of complicated. So when you present this story of, hey, look, here's a you know, good little hungry and that's trying to do their best, um, they've really had some success. Maybe I would, maybe not the average person on the street, but definitely within the elite conservative political circles um, with which I'm personally also acquainted um, there, there has been definitely some amount of traction. Mm -hmm. So one example could be at the Heritage Foundation, um, Victor Orban came and he was a guest speaker. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There are mm -hmm. many other uh, national premiers who come. But this was presented not because, oh, look what he's doing to his country, but, oh, look how he's standing up for his country mm -hmm. against Brussels. Mm -hmm. um, and the last example I'll give is there's something known as the conservative, like CPAC. Mm -hmm. It's a conservative conference for conservative grassroots, um, you know, sort of even grass tops, activists, speakers, authors, thinkers. And that's a U.S. based conference, but it has one international conference as well annually. And it's been in Budapest, Hungary. Mm. So there you go. Mm. Well, Mike, of course, when we talk about this relationship, first of all, between Donald Trump and Viktor Orban, again, we don't know whether it's personal or it's just diplomatic, but I want to dive into the conversation uh, regarding China at the same time. This is something that you wrote, and I want you. Uh, I want to read it to you. I want to get your further explanation, and I quote, Since joining Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, and Budapest has pursued a large-scale manufacturing collaboration with the Chinese electric vehicle companies. 
I mean, again, we know that the Belt and Road Initiative is one of the critical, or should we say, probably the largest projects under the current administration of Xi Jinping. Now, we believe that some countries from Europe and also from Southeast Asia slowly wake up this idea that Belt and Road Initiative might not be able to work or might not be suitable for some of the countries. But meanwhile, Meg, from your perspective, by participating or by becoming this part of Belt and Road Initiative, how should we assess this economic and this or even this political relationship between Beijing and Budapest at this moment. But meanwhile, again, I have to mention that when Donald Trump was the president in the U.S., we've seen this tariff war and we've seen this uh, political division between the two countries. And Victor, uh, Victor Orban, correct me if I'm wrong, seemed to be the mediator between China and the U.S. because he does because he was he's not interested in offending or, you know, breaking the bridges for either side. So how should we understand this participation in BRI? And what does that say about uh, Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Viktor Orban at this moment? These are wonderful questions. Okay, I'm going to try to paint a picture. Um, and also sort of uh, speak to um, a sub-question in your earlier question, which is, how has American conservatism or the American right changed under Donald Trump? Because mm. that speaks to this as well. So... His, when Donald Trump, I mean, he's a really famous person. He's a, a business magnate. You know, he had a very popular television show. He's always been in the American uh, national consciousness, but he kind of broke onto the political scene in 2015. And then his surprise win in 2016 completely changed the American right. And what it did is it brought a lot of populism in, mm. but it also made a lot of um, orthodoxies or accepted wisdom as it was it, it brought it under scrutiny mm. it brought it under two questions so one of the first things that he said was china mm. china is eating our lunch and now Ch he made china uh, in the national conversation because he's you know he's a business person he's in construction and he sort of realized that so much of our critical supply chain is all gone it's mm. all in china or in other countries where china has um, sort of like satellites of china like mm. let's say vietnam um, and so this this sort of focus on China as being an enemy as opposed to the earlier version, which was kind of under the neoconservative version. So maybe after the Soviet Union collapsed, going into the early 2000s of the Bush and Obama administration, the, the idea was that, you know, uh, sorry, Clinton as well, that we bring China into the World Trade Organization, we help it. We, we allow Chinese to develop. They'll forget about communism. They'll mm. become good liberal Democrats, and we can all join hands and dance together. Uh, that so that did not work, because as we've seen, China did get developed, but it stayed communist. Or, um, you know, what does communist mean? As in, it's not a liberal democracy, and it mm. has a very authoritarian structure, and it's just a very, very different civilization. It wasn't Chinese people don't want to, you know, shed that off and become new age westerners mm -hmm. they don't that's who they are so but what happened is that we lost by by we I, i'm an american citizen so i'm saying by by americans we lost our industrial capacity uh, from the from the 70s we had been outsourcing it anyway to let's say uh germany and japan but um in in world war ii the, those two countries lost and so they were under and, and to this day america has military bases there so it's under u.s military control mm. political influence as well whereas we outsource our manufacturing base to china china's not does not have a military base i mean a u.s military base we didn't defeat them in any war we're not un i mean they're not under us in any way and so they're free to do what they want with their wealth you know including start a new sino-centric china-centric massive block mm. which is you know symbolized by the Belt and Road Initiative, they can do whatever they want with their surplus profits. So the, this division on making, is China really somebody that we need to reckon with? Is China someone, someone as in like an entity on the, on the world stage that will threaten U.S. standing in the world? So these questions have really come to the forefront. Um, and 
what is what is the role of NATO? You know, should we be expanding NATO? Mm. Um, you're supposed to have two percent of your GDP spending if you if you want to, you know, have NATO protection. Most countries don't do that. Mm. Actually, Hungary is one that does. But all these sort of questions that nobody had ever questioned or asked. Now, all of a sudden, these came into the picture, and um, people like to put some kind of racist. Um, tonality to the word America first, because, you know, in the early to, um, 20th century, some other group had it. But basically, America first is in America first, second and third, but American workers first, American border security first, American trade first, because it's it has to be if it's free trade, that's fine, but it has to be fair trade. So these factors, you know, that's how the, the conversation on the right changed and it sort of forced the left to also reckon with these these ideas. So now when we look at that, now that we have this picture, that's why you see now NATO becomes important, the EU becomes important because we're still looking at a world which is is from, from the Western point of view. It's a US-led West mm. as, as basic um, developed world, the first world. Mm. And it's not to say that now... Well, I don't. It depends which side you're looking at. Some might look at it and say this is an oppressive block that needs to be knocked down. Some mm -hmm. might say no, they're actually good. They've kept the world from having a World War Three or a nuclear war. You know, so there are many ways of looking at it. But when you look at this particular group, they want to maintain things as they are. Of mm -hmm. course, you know, they want to make sure that. Um, their citizens are doing well. They want to, make, at least I, I can say Americans, some aspects do. When you look, I mean, everybody can uh, can sort of argue with me by saying, look at the border right now mm -hmm. and look at the illegal immigration. Look at, I mean, sure, yes, I understand that. But I'm saying, generally speaking, the governing class, even the deep state, what have you, want their country to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and the same goes for every country from China, India, Brazil, the EU. Mm -hmm. But when... When China comes to this picture, China wants to, and this is very important, and I want to uh, underscore, China also wants to be a superpower. And China wants to be the number one global superpower. Mm. So there's a lot of talk about, oh, the United States doesn't want to get lose its hegemony, doesn't want to lose its place. And that's why it's threatened by China or it doesn't like China. But it's not like China's just sitting put. China's actively trying to create a new world order in which it is the center. That is why I came up with the Belt and Road Initiative. That's the whole point of it. When you look at Europe, so I, I spent a year in Budapest, Hungary. I traveled um, in Slovakia, Romania, you know, all, the entire part of Croatia, Slovenia. So what is um, and Serbia, um, Bulgaria, all of those mm. places? What is China trying to do? China is trying to do exactly what it's doing in South America and in Africa. It goes to these very underdeveloped, or developing nations, which have sort of corrupt governments, or let's say an oligarchy-dominated uh, government, and they don't really have services in the private sector. And what does China say? Well, I can give you broadband technology, mm. and Huawei and CT are the main ones, but Huawei is the main one. And it says here, I'm going to give you broadband technology, which is important, which everybody wants and needs. But by doing that, it's not some kind of altruistic endeavor. Hey, look, from the goodness of our heart, we have all this extra money. We're going to give it to you. No, it's not. Because when Huawei comes in, it's a telecommunications giant. It's going to create an entire infrastructure. And with that, it creates an accompanying ecosystem that has e-commerce, e-finance, apps, what have you. And then that particular country is now integrated into the Sinosphere. Mm. And so with Hungary, for example, Hungary's actively, like I said, as you read out, Hungary started actively pursuing China, Beijing, and saying, we want to be your outpost mm. in Europe. Um, even though actually more money goes to Germany and France. The fact of the matter is that um, politically, only Hungary is with, is the country within the within NATO and within the EU that actively speaks out for China and supports various measures and resolutions that the EU wants to do to support China. So, for example, it twice blocked the EU from condemning the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. 
Why did it do that? Mm. It didn't need to do that, but it did that to show China that we are on your side. Mm. Similarly, when you look at Trump, yes, there seems to be some kind of romance. You know, like oh, I I love you. You you know, you're you're like I think he said he really wants、um, Trump to be the next president, and and Trump said you know look at him, he was supporting me. But that's just pol- political rhetoric.、Mm. When you actually look at the facts, when the Trump administration was you know in power, they told the Orban government to stay away from Huawei.、Mm. Why? Because Huawei uses artificial intelligence in its chips. It does. It is known for doing espionage, cyber espionage,、uh, data stealing. I mean, everybody does that. You can say, but they are. They've been known. They act as agents for the Communist Party of China, and they've been known to do all these things. And this is part of, like, you know, creating that cyanosphere. And so, the Trump administration repeatedly put pressure and said, "Do not do business with Huawei." And every single time, the Orban government rebuked. The Trump administration.、Mm. So when you actually look at it, they chose China over Trump.、Mm. And there's a massive R and D center、um, in in Budapest where they do、uh, AI development. There's a there's a lot that's happening there. And when you look at, for example, the country, this is Hungary's、um, emergency preparedness. You know, their entire infrastructure is just created and owned by China.、Mm. So it's not like you can just、um, you can't just You know, say, oh, I don't want China anymore. No, now you are actually integrated into the various、um, supply chains, the various value chains of China.、Mm-hmm. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say actually, I wouldn't say that、um, Viktor Orban is a mediator between between Trump. Yes, he wants to have his cake and eat it too. I would say that that's sort of a negative way of saying it.、Um, their official, their official motto is called. Connectivity.、Mm. So basically, they depend a lot on Germany and and the EU for trade, but they also want nine、uh, billion dollars as they got received last year from China in foreign direct investment. So they want to have both ways. But as it's increasingly happening, as we know, we are in a second Cold War with the West versus China. It's very different from the one that the United States had with the Soviet Union, but it is a Cold War nonetheless. And so. When you have China actively trying to upend the U.S.-led West and that order, and trying to create its own, then when you have a member of NATO and EU, you know, playing both sides or trying to have their cake and eat it too, that's when it becomes a problem. That's why you would say,、well, "Who cares about Hungary? Hungary is just a small state." Yes, but it becomes important because of what it's trying to do, because of the allies it's trying to create. At the same time. What's actually saying on the public stage is very different from what it's saying and doing in Hungary. In Hungary, for example,、uh, Viktor Orban in his messages to the people, or when Xi Jinping stopped by for、uh, you know during his May this this year in May, he did a European tour of five days, where he spent the majority in Budapest. What did Viktor Orban say? He said that there are two suns in the sky. And that basically the world superpower, which is America, is feeling bad, is getting threatened because it is slipping, and soon the second number two second power will, will become the number one superpower.、Mm-hmm. So his prophecy, his prediction is that China is going to win the 21st century, and Hungary wants to win it too. And、mm-hmm. so they're going to link, as I write my piece, conscious coupling. They want to couple or link their destiny with that of China.、Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 in fact, he did say this. He said. Even if Trump were to win this November in the U.S. national elections, it won't stop the decline of the United、mm. States in the West. So, so this is why I would say I don't know if he's like a mediator, but he's basically、uh, um, he and the Orban government. They are trying to get the best that they can from both, but it creates problems for not China. Of course, it's a benefit for China, but it creates problems for the U.S. led West, for the EU, and for the United States because. He's, it's an access point. It's become an access point for Chinese actors, bad actors or good actors. I don't know, but Chinese interests to use Hungary to use data、um, stealing, cybersecurity issues, trade issues,、um, defense, national security issues. They can they can use that as their entry point、mm. to、um, target the West.、Mm. Well, Meg, I got two more questions before. 
letting you go. Now, based on what you just said, again, I'm not a political scientist, but to me, from my perspective, it's about the word national interests. I mean, again, we'll look at Trump, or we'll look at Viktor Orban, or we'll look at Xi Jinping. There's no doubt that the national interests that top the agenda, and also you mentioned you know, about the artificial intelligence, the 5G network, and also this EV technology. I want to move on to the next question again. You wrote in the article that after the Soviet Union collapsed, Hungary aspired to become a liberal democracy. Now, when we talk about this liberal democracy agenda, and of course, this is one of the critical issues that actually is standing in the crossroads for America, for example. You know, we're looking at far right, looking at far left, and also look at there is a lot of uh, third party candidates as well. But from your perspective, how do you think that China today is able to understand this whole liberal democracy pro or even called a progressive movement? And also we're looking at this defender of the Christianities and the sovereignty putting it together. Because, I mean, again, there is no denying as we're speaking right now that Xi Jinping just held a major conference with all the African leaders, I mean, from all the countries. This is actually elevate, uh, elevating his image among the, uh, uh, the African countries. But meanwhile, how do you think that Xi Jinping or even the Communist Party is managing this whole liberal democracy, defender of the Christianity, and also a fit into this Chinese narrative or this Chinese interest in order to, again, as you said, elevate himself, elevate the country, and hopefully eventually become the superpower for the world. What do you say to that, Meg? I would say that the, the American project to create democracies around the world, the sort of nation-building, rebuilding, has been a colossal failure. Mm. And and when, as you said, it goes back to your first question, Trump's arrival onto the political state, stage made that a statement that many Americans on the right and center right now agree to. Mm. So the neoconservative status quo, which is uniparty, because it had um, George Bush senior and junior, Obama, Clinton, um, that whole Hillary Clinton, that whole group, wanted to say, yes, you know, we want to spread liberal democracy everywhere. We want to um, change the basic character of, of ancient civilizations in the Middle East, mm -hmm. in, in other parts of the world, and make them a replica of our own. And in fact, that was also what they were thinking with China. But that has been a complete disaster, complete disaster. And it's really cost American uh, goodwill. We've mm -hmm. lost a lot of that in the world because, you know, what happened? What happened after the Iraq war? What happened after Afghanistan? Nothing, right? I mean, so so I will say that nobody's perfect and that America has made a lot of mistakes by trying to be this messiah, this messianic power for creating democracy. However, that said, however, America, so it was not like the, the Br British, the British Empire was an official empire. Mm. Um, there's no official American empire, but, you know, you can look at, you know, our military bases everywhere, our interests everywhere. We are not and have never been an extractive power. So it's not like, um, you know, we are in Peru or let's say in the Congo trying to extract rare mineral earths and, and trying to create our own EV industry. We don't do that. The West generally, especially after the era of the empires, hasn't done that. You know, whereas China is doing that, but the way that China is doing it is very different from sort of what, let's say, uh, the British Empire, the French Empire did. I mean, they were also, especially the French, they were very mm. extractive. But this is different. What what China is trying to say here is that they're looking at countries in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in um, South America or Latin America, that are very poor and that don't have basic infrastructure to um, have economies that thrive in the 21st century. And and they're saying, listen, we want something from you. Mm. You know, we want your rare minerals, lithium or whatever they are that we want that. And they are, and they're saying, and we're going to give you X, Y, Z technology. However, that is 
all the infrastructure that China is investing in these countries is to support the extractive agenda. So, like I said, they're not just going and creating schools for children to study or for, uh, you know, for, to help farmers become semi-skilled mm -hmm. industry workers. It's not like that. Whatever is being created is being created so that it helps Chinese interests, as you said, national interests, in getting whatever raw materials they want. Um, they have, they need food. They're buying up agricultural land, even in the United States, because they need that. So wherever they can go and get, they are investing that money and getting it. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, when people talk about political polarization within countries, this is kind of in the world where they're saying, look, we, there are the haves and the have-nots, and we are the have-nots, but we're going to help you become haves if you throw your lot in with us. Um, so the idea of Christianity, of sort of going and converting everybody, that's not happening anymore. That's over. You know, that ended with the Spanish Empire. Um, we're not looking anymore at colonizing a place. So China isn't going and creating colonies. You know, it's not like a, uh, like the British were in India, for example, or, or the French were in Algeria. China isn't going and setting up Chinese colonies in Peru or in Congo. They're not doing that. Mm. What they're trying to say is sort of like you're a satellite state in that you do whatever you want politically, but we're going to get around all your red tape and we're going to get X, Y, Z from you. And for that, we'll set up your entire telecommunication structure mm -hmm. and we'll give you all the apps that you need in order to have uh, an economy in the 21st century. And so it's, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Mm -hmm. um, it's true. Now, now, it's, now, here's the thing. When you look at the studies and you see the, pe the countries that have, where the people have the worst opinion of China, so they have a very poor opinion of China, or for example, Australia, India, these are countries that have historically worked with the Chinese. Mm. So no offense to the actual Chinese citizens, but I'm just saying in terms of diplomacy, um, China doesn't do a good job. They're very much, they come in and they're, you know, very, they're like, I want this and you're going to get this. That's it. How you do it, what you want, it's up to you. So I, I don't believe that all these countries, like you said, in Africa, I don't believe that they want a world that is led by China. I don't believe that. I think they do want a world uh, that is led by any superpower that is kind, that doesn't interfere in their activities, that allows them to grow. But unfortunately, the U.S.-led West isn't doing that. You know, mm. we don't see... Then what well, actually I don't understand why not. You can think about it. The United States, let's say France, Germany, Japan could create a coalition and do the same thing and go to Africa and say, here, we're gonna help you with broadband technology. We're gonna do this. And I'm I can I mean this is just my opinion. Of course, it's not based on any fact, but I really do believe that the vast majority would go for that option mm. rather than the Chinese option. I really do believe that. However, they don't have that. And so there is a gap in the world market that China is utilizing to its advantage and that the West is not. So when you actually look at it, why, so why is China doing it? You know, people say China's harmony seeking, China's, um, you know, it's its own civilization and, and people in the West can't understand China because it's so different. And we try to apply our Western frames of mind and analyses onto China. No, it's actually very simple. Mm. China wants to be the next global superpower. Mm. And the way that you do that is by creating a block um, like the Belt and Road Initiative or the 16 plus 1, 17 plus 1, where you have all these economies integrated within the major Chinese one. Mm. So every single, not, none of these countries can now exist outside of China because your entire digital infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure is owned and created by China. So you're locked into that Sinocentric ecosystem. And this is a way of getting power. This is a way of, you know, becoming number one. And, you know, that's in their national interest. They're doing that. But I really do believe that the different countries who are getting into this, if they had an option, another option, they would definitely choose that. Mm. Meg, I want to wrap up our conversation by asking you the last question. Again, coming back to what's happening today in the U.S. Again, uh, in a two months, I mean, we're going to see mm -hmm. the election result. Again, we don't know it's going to be Trump or Harris 
But meanwhile, going back to your article, you wrote, and I quote, Mr. Orban predicts that illegal immigration, identity politics, and warmongering have doomed the hegemonic West, whereas har harmony-seeking China will win the 21st century. Again, you've been repeating and also you've been saying that China is very much interested to become the superpower for the whole world. But meanwhile, when we talk about the illegal immigration, the identity politics and what mongering, everything going happening in the U.S., what are the expectations from someone like Viktor Orban? What are the expectations, again, like Xi Jinping? I mean, they are paying attention or closer attention to this election. Put in a very simple, Mac. Do they expect someone like Donald Trump, do they expect someone from the far right or perhaps even Harris to actually solve those issues and so that they can have better collaboration or a better cooperation, not just on this political level, but also from this economic standpoint? Because again, we're seeing this country is competing with China and we're seeing this country is leading in many ways. But how do we and what are their expectations to see the changes from the most practical and tangible way. Your final thoughts. So I haven't actually meant to push back a little earlier when you use the word the term far right. Mm. Um, I don't know that this is the far right. I mean, even a conservative group would not be called a far right. I guess if you want to say um, it's very this odd thing about American politics where there's nothing called the far left because mm. you can go as extreme as you want, but you never get called the far left. Um, I think it's sort of, a, we all sort of accept that if you get into um, like race supremacy of any sort, if you get into sort of eugenics like Hitler, that's going into um, the far right. So I, I don't, I would not, I mean, this is my take, uh, although a lot of people on the left uh, would disagree, but generally speaking, nothing that the Trump administration did in its first, um, its first term of four years uh, falls under far, far right. I mean, it, the Trump administration governed just like any other regular center-right conservative administration. He might talk a big talk and get into trouble with his tweets, but I don't. I don't believe that anything said or done falls under the official definition of far right. Mm. However, like I said, there is there has been a, a tumultuous change like a paradigm shifting change in what it means to be somebody center right or an american conservative post trump so there has been a very big change in the republican party um and yes there's a lot at stake there is so much at stake at this upcoming election if you if you've looked at um any of his rallies any any of um now it's trump and vance jd vance is vice the vice president of not sorry, the vice presidential nominee, when you look at the amount of people that are supporting him, it seems to be that he, it would, he would win in a landslide. Mm. I mean, all the polls, if you believe them, are saying they're putting him at uh, several percentage points above Harris. However, like you said, there's so much at stake. It's not going to be a regular election where, okay, the best person wins. No, um, there, the, like I said, identity politics or wokeism, there are so many people who benefit from that. There are people who benefit from the warmongering. There are people who benefit from having the old new conservative status quo. The, there are people who still want to engage in nation building. There, mm. So there's a lot of the people who are in power that still want to stay in power. The American people, the vast majority of American people do not agree and mm. do not want that. But how easy is it for a populist candidate to break through the two party system that we have in which basically permanent Washington. So all the agencies, the bureaucrats, they decide who is acceptable. You know, OK, maybe this time it's going to be a Democrat. This time it's going to be a Republican. But as long as the president does not up and the status quo, they're OK with it. Here you have Trump and Vance saying that they will do that, mm -hmm. that they will completely change everything. So, yes, there's a lot there's a lot at stake. And what can Xi Jinping expect? He can expect if Trump administration wins to see pushback. Mm -hmm. Definitely. He can see that he can have pushback. Now, it's not like the old Cold War. Obviously, um, there is massive amount of 
uh, economic entanglement between the United States and China. And even if we've reduced our imports from China, we're still importing from countries whose supply chains depend on China, mm -hmm. like Vietnam, for example, or Mexico. So it's not something that can switch off. But yes, I do believe that we, if Trump and the Trump wins again in a second term, we will see in place a five to 10 year program to either develop technology, AI, bring back our manufacturing, create new manufacturing, sort of reshore that. And I guess not just de-risking, but decoupling mm. as, as much as is possible. Yes, we're going to see that. And uh, yes, there is going to be a change because if you do have a Trump administration, there is going to be uh, a stress on establishing the U.S.-led West uh, as the number one power, the superpower of the world, and maintaining the United States global standing in the world, which includes maintaining the United States dollar as the world's worldwide currency. As far as Viktor Orban, um, I think he's going to have to choose. They have to choose. You know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I think they don't want to do that, which mm -hmm. is not in their national interest in doing that. But I do believe that despite having defied the Trump administration and having gotten away with it, um, definitely Trump will, the Trump administration will say, you have to choose. If you're going to be within the European Union and the NATO ally, you're going to have to play with us. You know, you can't keep biting the hand that feeds you. You have to be with us. So um, I would say uh, a reassertion of, of American exceptionalism, a reassertion of American dominance and leadership on the global stage, that is what you can expect if um, somehow they allow Trump and his partner to win. I mean, mm. there's a lot that's going to go on. It's very, very complicated and messy. But if we have a, a new Trump administration, then these are the things that these other national leaders can expect. Well, Mac, you're right. Even though right now it is still too early to know that what the result will be. But meanwhile, this election in the U.S., not only will affect the lives domestically, but also internationally. We're seeing, again, the bigger actors such as China and, and uh, Viktor Orban from Hungary and also, like you mentioned, France and Germany. They're all watching how this election is going to pay out. But again, at the end of the day, it is critical as we continue our conversation, continue to understand the interest from all the players. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor to speak to Mac Henson. Again, Mac Henson just completed a one-year research and teaching fellowship in Budapest, Hungary. Again, she's an amazing speaker where she uh, was a serve a senior fellow in Budapest the fellowship program and a visiting fellow at the Donald Bay Institute. Well, Mac, thank you so much for your time. I mean, it's been a pleasure and we are amazed by your insights and expertise and not only from your a re a writing but also from your study and research we love to have you back on the show as we continue and hopefully next time we talk it will be after finding out the election results